Genesis chapter 39, beginning in verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's official, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had, with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master did not concern himself, does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Sends reading of God's holy word. Let us pray together. Lord God, we come before you who are strong, and you know that we are weak, that uh, we know this, Lord, and we know that the frames of men are are weak, but we pray, Father, that uh, in spite of this, that you would speak through these weak means, this weak vessel even here this day, in order to make the strength of yourself known and proclaimed clearly throughout all the world. Pray for clarity of thought and of mind, and that you would give us uh, uh, wisdom and insight into your word. Father, we pray that you would soften hard hearts and open blind eyes. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if it's ever uh, happened to you or not um, before, but when you are you know, standing around, uh, shooting the breeze with some of your friends, and the conversation turns to how, uh, you know, so-and-so from high school or from college or from uh, 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 someone past in your life. Uh, you know that kid who was always in trouble. He was always a troublemaker. And the conversation turns to how that one has been having a rough time lately. His wife left him. He's having trouble with the police. Uh, and no one's really surprised because, you know, it's an accepted fact that if you're doing bad things, it's only a matter of time before things will catch up with you. And you'll get your comeuppance. You know, uh, you know, the implication 
for the rest of us, when we hear that particular conversation goes the other way as well, if you're, good per if you're a good person, good things will indeed happen to you. There is some truth to that. There are consequences to her actions. You know, if a man beats his wife, she's uh, uh, going to resent her husband. She's going to fear her husband, eventually probably going to call the cops on her husband. And those consequences will have to be deal dealt with. But the question is, is it always the case? Do good people always receive and experience good things only? And do the wicked always receive evil? Always, at all times. If you're a Christian, I mean, this question gets a little more complicated for us when God is brought into the conversation. And the question is, you know, do we receive good things from God when we obey and bad things come into our life when we don't? Is there this, you know, one toward one correlation that God loves us when we indeed obey and God hates us or at the very least is disappointed with us when we disobey him? He's going to probably discipline us in some way for it. And so the question is, is that the way God works? This sort of idea of a, a, a karma, that there's, there's always something that follows your actions. Is that a real thing when we are speaking about the God of the Bible? With that in mind, I'd like us to look at our text this morning. Where we see in our text, uh, it opens up, and we see a man raised in exaltation. Raised in exaltation. You come to Genesis 39, and the story picks up right where it kind of left off in, in chapter 37. You know, 37 ended with uh, uh, Joseph being sold into slavery and taken down into Egypt to be sold to Potiphar. And here we pick right up at the same place. You know, Joseph has been brought down to Egypt and sold by the Ishmaelites to Egyptians, specifically into the house of Potiphar. And it seems as though after that, you know, unusual, uh, disturbing detour about Judah and Tamar, the main story is back on track. We're right back where we left off. And yet, as we come to this chapter this morning, it will become clear why that odd story of Judah and Tamar is here, in this particular place in the Bible. Because at least one of the things happening in this text that you'll notice is there is a comparison going on between Joseph and Judah. There is a strong contrast being made between them. There's almost a, a foil here, if you will. One child of Israel, though he is not oppressed, though he's able to remain in the promised land and receive the blessings of God freely as part of God's chosen people, and yet he wanders away from God's people. And the promises of God for 20 years, he openly oppresses the helpless, indulging in whatever sin he so desires without thinking twice about it, all without any apparent consequences, you'll notice. And suddenly the story turns back to Joseph here before us this morning, this other son of Israel who's been sold into slavery by his own flesh and blood. And he will suffer for that what seems to be no apparent reason. And you reason, realize, you know, as this contrast is being made, just how terrible uh, the situation is for Joseph. You just kind of have to uh, put yourself in his shoes and imagine the kind of pain he's going through. This is real pain that he is going through. Just think about it for a minute. You know, the story turns fairly quickly as you come to chapter 9, but Joseph's situation is not good. Uh, he's no longer a free man. He's no longer able to go about freely or do whatsoever he wishes at, or as he pleases. But now he is bound to the will of a master. And, he is, uh, and if slavery in and of itself isn't bad enough, he happens to serve a man who happens to be an Egyptian, the way the story lays this out. It, it's something very significant to the people of Israel as Moses writes to a group of people who have just been oppressed by this very same people. A very significant weight in saying that this is an Egyptian man who he serves under. Joseph is away from all of his family. His brethren have betrayed him. His homeland is now far away. He is all alone. And we think, as we come to this text, he has been abandoned by the, pro or the promises of God are uh, far and distant away from him. And yet the very next words that we read in verse 2, after we've seen how low Joseph have fall has fallen, are these. 
But the Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered him. God is still with Joseph. Five times in the first five verses, we read how God is with Joseph and promises uh, and is prospering him in some way. God hasn't abandoned Joseph. That is very clear, and it is intentional that you see this. Though it may seem that way, though he is all alone, though everyone around him has abandoned him, in the midst of all his trouble, as he goes down into this place of Egypt, Yahweh is still there, and he is with his dear child. In the midst of everything that he is going through, Significant that they use the or that the narrator uses the word Yahweh here, that it's used to declare who God is. God has many names in the Bible. Jehovah, he has Adonai or Lord, and each name has different implications. To be called Jehovah means that he is your provider. To be called uh, Adonai or Lord means that he is your master in some way, that you serve him in some way. But when Yahweh is used here, it is because here down in Egypt, in this place, is the God of the covenant. The God who has promised to his people that he will be with them. This one who keeps his promises and passes his promises on to their children and those who are far off. This is the God who is here with Joseph now. And he is here to bring blessing. And in the midst of all his trouble, God is here and he is prospering Joseph. Joseph is like Abraham and Isaac before him, even Jacob. All of whom God prospered abundantly in very tangible, visible ways. And the text tells us anything that is put in Joseph's hands prospers. You, know, you get the sense Joseph has uh, uh, the Midas touch. Everything he touches prospers and it becomes golden. This blessing of God, it comes upon Joseph, but it goes through Joseph and beyond him, even to the house of the Egyptians. These Gentiles of the earth are indeed blessed all because Joseph, uh, Joseph's hand being touched upon and all that he was put, uh, puts his hand upon prospers. And Potiphar, being an, uh, an observant man, he puts Joseph in charge of this whole house and field. Everything that uh, is his and Joseph is raised up in authority. His status is raised. He is being elevated. He is being exalted. And he moves from a very low point uh, uh, you know, as a slave on the auction block. You can sort of see his ascent here. It becomes uh, uh, from a slave on the auction block that could have been sold to anyone. Instead, he is sold into the house of a great man, uh, an aristocrat, if you will. Uh, and then from working for this aristocrat, he's not sold as uh, a man working out in the field who would have had uh, experienced harsh labor, been under a harsh taskmaster. Instead, he works inside of the house and he is continually being raised up and elevated, even in this place of slavery. While he is under his master, he wins his master's favor, becomes Potiphar's personal attendant. And finally, he's put in charge of Potiphar's house, the entirety of this house. And everything continues to prosper so much that the text tells us Potiphar worried about nothing Except, except what he ate and drank. A very Hebrew word, a way of saying he has no concern of anything within this house except his private needs. And Joseph is raised up to this high place. He becomes this exalted one in a land not his own, with a people who are not his own, even blessing a foreign people, all because God is with him. God was with him when he was sold into slavery. He's with him now, prospering him, causing everything in his life to come about. And that is so much the case now when Joseph is prospering, you know, as, as when, um, excuse me. <laughs> and that is so much the case now when Joseph is prospering. All of a sudden we see Joseph fall into the hands of Potiphar's wife as a man unjustly accused. A man unjustly accused. I guess what my point was that I missed, I was trying to say, was that even when this particular situation unfolds, we will see God is still with him. And as you move into verses 6 through uh, 18, you see trouble kind of looming on the horizon. You know, that storm cloud growing off in the distance. And you know it's brewing. 
Well, it starts off with the simple words that Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. You know, basically, he's built well and handsome. Uh, he's got his mother's genes, literally. Rachel was a, a beautiful woman in the eyes of Jacob, and he seems to have inherited that. Uh, he looks good, you know, and he is a, he is a, a guy who is somewhere between the ages of probably around uh, uh, 17 to 21 in here. You know, and everything that this good-looking young fellow does turns into gold, and all of a sudden, Things to go, go south very quickly for Joseph because, lo and behold, a married woman takes interest in a good-looking, prosperous man. Uh, you know, same old story, just a different day. Uh, Potiphar's wife, the wife of his master, sees him and she desires him. The Hebrew says she lifts up her eyes upon Joseph and she says very simply in two Hebrew words, it's very coarse and brash and quick, it is, lie with me. Just, that's it. Nothing else. I want nothing more from you, but I want you to bed me, young man. Just to be clear, she's not asking. She is telling him. She commands Joseph to bed her. Joseph is a slave. He has no rights. He has no freedom, save those given to him of his, by his master. And she is his master's wife. Technically, she, or wife. She is technically in charge of him. And she commands him to come and lie with her. And this is very normal in that particular cultural setting. But I want you to think really hard in this situation what Joseph does here. Joseph, this guy who is all alone. There is no one around him. No one who would see him or care if he breaks his faithfulness to a, a God who has indeed put him in slavery and in chains. Who has, uh, uh, there is no one seeing that he would remain pure and faithful to God. There is no one around to hold, or to hold him to his faith. No one around him even holds his particular faith and his religion. No family is around looking over his shoulder. Here is a young Mature man who normally could be slayed a, a little bit easier than an older, wiser, more mature man. I say normally. Don't give yourselves too much credit uh, here, men. Uh, a man who's... You just look at this man. He is a man whose family has abandoned him. He has been sold into slavery. He has every excuse and opportunity to be embittered about the circumstances that God has brought into his life, and indeed to indulge in this sin. You know, I deserve this break, don't I? I deserve a little bit of pleasure or something in my life. It isn't about time for something good to happen to me. I mean, everything and everywhere you look here, people of God, there is an excuse for Joseph to give in to her seduction. After all... Some may say, what choice does he have? He is a slave. He must do the will of his master. And yet he says, I cannot do this thing. I cannot sin against my master or my God. What a powerful speech. You know, and, and uh, immediately what we think we ought to see, is, you know, victory in Jesus, right? We should all start singing and dancing because he resisted once through this very powerful speech. And now victory is surely his and it's all been said and done. But that's not what happens. It says day after day after day after day, she seeks to seduce him saying again, lie with me. Lie with me. Give up your God. Give up your morals. Day in and out. I mean, some of us might be able to resist the first day. Depending on how tempting this particular uh, uh, seductress is or if this is the particular sin that we desire. But day in and out to have that temptation right in the forefront of your eyes. Constantly. I don't care who you are, if you are struggling against a sin that you are faced with daily like this, it begins to work on your mind, it begins to dull your resistance, you begin to allow yourself to justify why it would be good for you to do this particular sin, why it is reasonable for you to give up. It is a particularly alluring sin here. And Joseph has all of these reasons to sin here, and yet he does not. Quite a contrast to Judah, right? And Judah, who seeks out a cult prostitute the moment chance presents itself, one who has every 
reason to be able to resist against the wiles of the devil, and yet he does not. Joseph, on the other hand, he has every reason not to resist, and yet he does. How convicting is this that we so easily fall into our lusts and desires? I mean, who of us could put up such a resistance to such a temptation? Most of us are more like Potiphar's wife than Joseph, to be quite frank, and I'll explain why I say that in a minute. But just think about what we see here. This goes on day after day after day until Potiphar's wife can't take it anymore. And she says, uh, you know, she, it says she basically gets him all alone. All the servants are dismissed out of the house, although Joseph doesn't realize it. And she grabs him and she forces herself upon him and says, lie with me. This very violent action here. The text basically says she is preparing to uh, um, uh, uh, violate him. It's the most violent action of a female in the whole of the Old Testament. She grabs hold of the thing that she desires and she will not let go. This is so much the case that Joseph leaves his garment behind. And just like that, as you read these words, you are right back in the garden again. Potiphar's wife, she sees something with her eyes. She desires it. She sees that it is good for her. And she, her desire grows until she reaches out her hand to violently take. It's the same thing that you see happen with Adam and Eve. They see, they desire, and eventually they reach out and they take it. Same thing that we see with Pharaoh back in Genesis 12 when he saw Sarah and uh, uh, he desired her and they take And he ultimately takes her. I mean, this pattern repeats itself again and again and again throughout Genesis. We see the same pattern over and over again because people of God, that is the pattern of sin. We see something that we owe we not not to take or ought not to indulge in. It is not something that is given to us for whatever reason, and yet we desire it and we reach out and we eventually take it anyway. Whether it's another man's wife or stolen time from the office or doing things just to look good in front of others. You know, whatever the particular sin is that you uh, struggle with, whatever idol we bow down to in place of God, whatever sin so easily entangles us, the root of that sin in our lives boils down to the same sin that we see with Adam and Eve that we see here, seeing and desiring and eventually taking. And that is why we look more like Potiphar's wife. You know, when Joseph actually gets away, as he flees and he leaves his garment behind, then we too do what we see Potiphar's wife doing here. We shift the blame, don't we? And it's not our fault that we did this. As soon as we know that it's not uh, going to be in our favor anymore, you know, uh, uh, notice what she does. It's not her fault, she tells the servants. It's that Hebrew's fault. Behold, his garment for the second time now in Joseph's life, he will be judged by his garment that's been removed, once being pronounced dead and now being pronounced guilty. And Potiphar comes into the house and his wife says, this wouldn't have happened if you, Potiphar, very pointedly, hadn't brought the, this Hebrew to live with us. It's your fault that this particular thing happened. Do you hear the echo going on there? Back to the garden again. The woman you gave me, God, she gave me the fruit and I ate. It's not my fault. That's what we do. We shift the blame. You neglected me, so I had to find someone else who would meet my particular needs. You, neglect, you never gave me a raise in all the time I worked for you, so I just took whatever I needed when I needed it. We blame everyone else for what we do. We blame God. We blame our spouse. We blame the object of our desire. We are guilty. And yet all the while we justify our sins and pass the blame on, even in this context, to the guiltless one. This one who is condemned unjustly. Notice Joseph is innocent of all these things that have been charged to him. He has done absolutely nothing wrong. And yet what happens? This one who has been obedient to God, this one who has not betrayed his master or his God, this one who has done no wrong. He's vindicated, right? Because good things always happen to good people and bad things always happen to bad people. No, what we see, what is it that we see here? We see an innocent man accused and then lowered in humiliation. Lowered in humiliation. 
Joseph, the text emphasizes, is completely innocent of all wrongdoing. He does everything right the first time, and yet he is judged guilty, and he is condemned and put into prison. He has been fully obedient to God, and yet he suffers. Notice what the text tells us as you come to verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. Throughout this whole situation, through everything that has taken place, God has been with Joseph. He has not abandoned this child of God. He shows his steadfast love to him. The word used here is hesed. Again, this is, uh, this is God's covenant faithfulness. This is Yahweh being faithful to the covenant that he made with Joseph. And with his forefathers, that even though Joseph has been again thrown into a pit. Interesting, it's the same word as used uh, for prison as for the pit that he was thrown in earlier. That though it is just like when his brothers abandoned him and now his master has abandoned him and he is left to rot in prison. God is still with him and it is repeated and it is emphasized even in this low place in his life. God is with him in the worst of his circumstances. And so are God's promises. He will never leave him nor forsake him. And you come to verse 21 through 23, and we see this almost a complete repeat of what happened in the first five verses. Joseph's prison guard takes notice that God was with Joseph and blessing him, and he puts him in charge, and he pays no attention to anything that he does because God is with him. And we look at all this, and have to ask ourselves, what is going on here? I mean, a chapter ago, we saw Judah getting away with all kinds of sins and falling into all kinds of temptations, and he didn't really suffer from those, the ramifications of those sins at all. And now here, Joseph, this one who has done absolutely nothing wrong, he is truly, in every sense of the world, word innocent, and yet he is suffering more for it. That just goes against the grain of how we think the world ought to be, right? The righteous are oppressed and the wicked seem to prosper. Joseph, who obeys God, suffers wrong. And Judah, who blatantly disobeys God, prospers. And this happens in the church. Both Judah and Joseph are ultimately part of God's family here. So how do we read this? How do we understand what is going on? How do we make sense of it? How is it that God is ultimately caring for both of these particular children in their different circumstances of obedient and disobedient and prosperity and suffering? There's an old country song I remember hearing. It starts out with this boy who gets into a fight or trouble at school or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Um, the boy's expecting to be punished by his father, and his father sits down and he says, <sighs> Sorry, this is, this is a personal. Uh, he says, Let me tell you a secret about a father's love. A secret that my daddy said was just between us. You see, daddies don't just love their children every now and then, it's a love without an amen. You see, we, we're tempted to believe truly that God loves us more when we obey and less when we disobey. But God loves his people, not because of anything good in them or anything good in you, but because you are his child. If you rest in the promises given and declared in Christ Jesus, then you indeed are his child. But more than that, he loves you. Because he sent his son, one who had been ruling over all things, one who was high and he made him low, bringing him into humility, lower even than the angels. And this son, who was an upright and sinless son, the one who never did anything wrong, who walked upon this earth even as one who was sinless, and yet he suffered for 30 years as we suffer and in every way. And yet this innocent, guiltless man, this one who was able to restrain and keep himself from all forms of temptation, he is unjustly accused and he suffers and he is ultimately killed and dies and descends into the pit or into the grave. 
only to be raised up to exaltation again on the third day, to a rule that is greater than his first exaltation. People of God, don't you see? God loves you not because of any good within you, but because he sent one, an innocent man, to live and suffer and die in your place so that he might bring his children into his presence. He blesses us not because of our obedience, but because of Christ. He causes us to suffer not because of our disobedience. It certainly isn't the reason Joseph suffers here, but for his own good reasons that we rarely see the end result for. God often uses things in the Bible. We see this in the cross. We see it in Joseph's story. He uses things that he hates, suffering, men being wronged unjustly, in order to bring about those things which he loves. Because ultimately, through the suffering of both of these innocent men, Joseph and Christ, God will redeem and deliver a particular people. He will save them from certain death. For one, he will deliver his people from certain starvation. And through the other, through the greater son, he will deliver them from certain and everlasting death. So people of God, God is not arbitrary. What he brings into your life, he has some purpose in it. He's not uh, doing it to repay you for some evil that has been done before. That's uh, That's not how the Christian life works. This isn't karma. Something, sometimes good things happen to the wicked and wicked things happen to the righteous, but God uses all of it, everything that you go through, whatever it might be, somehow he works it to bring about his good purposes in this life that are ultimately for his glory and our good. We may not understand it. We may never understand it, but we do know that it is ultimately working together for his good somehow. May we rest And trust in that truth, even as we rest in Christ Jesus as our Savior, the one who suffered all sorts of wrongs, who was unjustly accused in order to bring the people of God, or bring God the most glory by redeeming a people through it. People of God, we have done nothing that deserves God's love. And yet he calls you his children. Because of the faithful one, Christ Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior. Let's pray together. Oh, great Heavenly Father. We come before you and we often are troubled with the circumstances you bring into our lives. There are many things that we don't understand. We don't understand the sicknesses. We don't understand uh, uh, the little ways that we suffer. We don't understand the way things happen and why, but we pray, God, that you would cause us to rest more securely, knowing that you have your hand upon us. You know the number of hairs on our head. You know uh, when the sparrows fall in the field. And surely, Father, your children are worth more than many sparrows. Father, we pray that you would strengthen our faith in this. Cause us to see what you have done and what you have worked on our behalf through Christ Jesus, causing him to suffer unjustly in order to redeem a people, even ourselves, who rest and trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. Father, we pray that you would build up your church through this very gospel that you give to us. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.